Yeah. Well, <laughs> that didn't work out very well. We were planning on doing a stream with Dr. Peter Williams today, but um, for the life of me, we cannot get the software to function the way we need it to to do the stream. So I'm going to look for a new solution. I hate. I'm so sorry, you guys. I've I've I spent time and money finding an interview solution um, that is. It's. It looks like it's just too much. It requires too much technology for people to do it. I just need to be able to send people a link and have them be able to click it and go live. And it's it's like every time I, I send it to someone, they're like, well, this, is, this isn't working right. And so we tried a bunch of stuff. Dr. Peter Williams said he was, his schedule's more open because of all the things that are going on right now. So he's happy to do this later this week. I'm thinking maybe Friday, maybe. I'll, I'll put up on my YouTube channel when we're gonna be able to do it live. So just recap. We're not able to do the live stream right now. Um, uh, what I what I can do is reschedule it and replan the exact same live stream for later this week. I'm sorry for those of you who uh, were really looking forward to this. You'll just have to wait a little bit. You'll have to be patient. We'll still do the stream and we'll still get it all done. Um, yeah, I uh, man, we're sitting here. We're able to talk to each other, you know, through Zoom, but we wouldn't we weren't able to get it up onto YouTube. And I know there's those of you who are like, oh, that's easy. You click a button. Uh, Take my word for it. There's more to it than that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's it. Good morning. And uh, for those who are maybe watching from England, because that's where Dr. Williams is, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, usually we don't do stuff this early. So, so I appreciate you you joining me. I got I got nothing for you though right now. <laughs> just I'll just let you know what we got planned right now for the future. Um, yeah. So Dr. Peter Williams, we've got coming up. God willing. Um, We'll have maybe Friday sometime real soon. We'll talk about his his book and his work on uh, the Gospels being trustworthy. Uh, he's a legit scholar, great work, brilliant man, and and funny as well. So that helps. Let's see. Um, we also have an interview coming up real soon with Natasha Crane for parents who want to talk to their kids about Jesus in particular. And she's um, very thoughtful and thorough, and she's worked with parents on how to strategize on how to raise your kids with uh, with Christianity and especially in the modern world the world we live in today with all the conflict and and uh, issues that are going on including apologetic stuff so we'll be having her on soon and I'm working on the Sunday night service we're gonna be talking about Jesus when he talked about this Sunday night about cutting your hand off cutting your foot off and whatnot so yeah I would do a, I see you there, uh, Ben, uh, I would do a cat cam, but I don't have it set up right now because I was set up for an interview and I, there's too much going on to worry about cat cams during interviews, but, but uh, no, the cats are, are wild right now. They're running around destroying the world, um, as can be expected. Yeah. Somebody asked a question here. Um, I, I didn't see the, oh, there it is. Uh, George Melky says, uh, is scripture dictated by God? And the answer is, um, in most cases, I think the answer is no. In some cases, yes. Uh, there's times where uh, there's a direct, exact, like God spoke and they wrote down what God said. And I would lean towards thinking these are more verbatim reports of what God said than they are like summaries of what God said, although either would be acceptable. But but I would think that in those cases, we're looking at like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a quote of God. I mean, they don't have the same quote um, methods and, you know, styles of doing quotes. We're, we're very concerned in our current culture with like quotes that are rigidly exact word for word. Like we italicize or we put brackets around something to show that when we quote people, we're not, we're not, we're adding this for context. Um, we, we quote page numbers and all that. that. That's like sort of a current obsession and it's, it's, it's good and bad. It's, it's a mixed bag. Um, so they didn't necessarily want to quote so perfectly but they may have. I'm just saying they didn't have the same obsession as us. There weren't necessarily quotations around the words of Jesus, for instance, in every case. Some of it could be a reworking of what Jesus said in some sense. A faithful reworking under the inspiration of the Spirit. But yeah. But yeah, but for the rest of Scripture, I think, no, God, uh, it says that they, they, they spoke as moved by the Holy Spirit, that they were inspired. But we see different flavors. We see the vocabulary of this gentleman versus that gentleman. We see those kinds of things. And even when God speaks to people, I think his vocabulary changes because it's limited to the vocabulary of the person he's talking to. So even when they're when they're writing out a, a, a comment from God, it's going to be speaking to them in a language they can understand. You know, if God speaks to me and he decides to speak Greek to me, I'm not going to get it. He's going to speak to me in, in words I understand. So anyway, that's just a random, random thought. 
Um, let's see here. I, I don't know. I'm just going to hit some of your guys' questions because I got nothing else to do right now, and I was planning on doing this interview. And you're here, and I'm here, and so we'll talk about a couple things. If you're just joining, Peter Williams, we had so many tech issues that we finally gave up and said, let's reschedule this after I've had a chance to work with my software figured out. So for the next like couple minutes, I can uh, hang out with you guys. Thanks to the mods for being here early in the morning. Earliest for me because I'm in LA. So it's like, it's like eight in the morning when I first signed on to do all this stuff. Eight in the morning. Who does anything at eight in the morning? Let's see, uh, Judah Matthews has a question. It says, Mike, is it accurate to say that the difference uh, BW, I don't know what BW stands for, B forward slash W, between, the difference between the law and grace is the New Test in the New Testament is primarily or even entirely about how righteousness is established, not what specific acts are sins or not sins. Um... I don't know that I, I don't know that I can offer a, a distinction. Let me read that question one more time for those who are listening and are curious to understand it better. The question is: Is it accurate to say that the difference between the law and grace in the New Testament is primarily or even entirely about how righteousness is established, not what specific acts or sins or not sins? It, it seems to me that there's some element of of both of those, because we get the idea that we're not under the law, but I, I think that that not under the law you know, that not being under the law. So then it has to do with what acts are sins versus not sins. Um, let me come back to that in a second. But I think the primary thing is that, yes, we're, we're saved by grace, not through works. We're saved by purely by God's grace, not by our works. And this is, this is like a very black and white issue. Um, yeah. Lobbying, you're going to earn your salvation, earn your forgiveness, earn your place with God in heaven or in eternity and glory in the new heaven and new earth. Or, Grace being it's going to be a free gift accomplished by Jesus only, and you simply trust in him and receive it. And so that, that to me is the big, the big difference. But because we're under grace, that has implications about whether, uh, how the law applies to us as, as new covenant believers. So we're, we're no longer under the law in the sense of um, a tutor. So, you know, Galatians talks about this. It says we're under the law, just like a, a child is under a tutor or a, a schoolmaster, a teacher, you know, that the teacher's like, Hey, sit down, put your stuff away, pick your stuff up, go over there, stand in the corner. The teacher has all these commands for you that you have to obey when you're young. And then when you graduate, and you're no longer under the tutor or the teacher, they no longer have that authority in your life. And so there was a time when their, their statements were binding, but because you're not under them, their statements are not binding in the same way. So that we're not disobeying the law. We're simply not under it. And there's a huge difference there. We're not disobeying it. There's no right to disobey the law, but we're not under it. So yeah, I hope that that, that gives you a, an answer to your question. Um, I'm, for those who aren't as familiar with the New Testament, I'm quoting various random parts of verses as a way of establishing my theology here, but you may not know that those are actually parts of scripture. Uh, the, the text tells us we're not under the law. Um, Galatians, though, it makes this case. If you just read through the book of Galatians, it makes the case that we're not under the law for salvation. And therefore, we're not under the law for uh, our daily living either. And then it talks about the, the new thing that we need to do is focus on walking in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And that is, of course, the law of Christ. I hope that's good for you. So we're just, I'm just doing a random Q&A here, guys. This is impromptu and, uh, and uh, hectic, I imagine. I see uh, something here from Aisha who says, let's see. Jesus said he was not going to eat Passover with the disciples in Luke twenty two sixteen. 16. Why does the church call the last supper, the Passover meal? Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember the details around this. Um, this is where Jesus says that he's not going to eat and I can bring it up for you guys. And again, I was not planning this. So this is, this is, this is, this is such false advertising. Here you are. You come for, for Peter Williams and you get Mike Winger. You come for uh, other Gospels, Reliable, and you get a Q&A. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm just going to deal with how sort of disjointed some of this stuff looks at the moment. Let's see. Oh, that'll be good enough. All right. Um, let's see. 
Um, okay, so when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it. I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So it, it seems to me that, um, and let me read your question again. Okay, so Jesus is, he's at the Passover, at the final Passover. He's the Passover meal, or I should say, maybe to be careful, the meal before Passover is where, what he's at right now. He's about to be crucified. This is the week of the crucifixion. And um, your question is, Jesus said he was not going to eat the Passover with the disciples. Why does the church call the Last Supper the Passover meal? So he, what he's saying here, he's acknowledging two things. He's earnestly desired to eat this Passover. So the past, they're having a meal. Now they would talk about Passover. They would use the term to talk about the whole week. And they have a variety of different meals going on during that week. So we think of it as only being the day, the one day of the Passover. But it's, Passover was a whole feast and it was several days long. Um, so, you know, he says, yeah, the, this Passover is the one he's eating now. So he's acknowledging he's eating that initial Passover, the Last Supper. And then he says he won't eat it again until the future when the, uh, when the kingdom comes. So that, I think probably the closest, uh, you know, eschatological parallel, the closest like future thing that we see to, to correspond to the fulfillment of eating it again, fulfilled in the kingdom, what might be the marriage supper of the lamb. So he's saying, Hey, here's me and my suffering. The next time I'm going to be sitting and feasting with my people will be in the kingdom and we'll be in that full, the second coming. And so that's exciting. Um, yes. So yeah, I'll take some more questions from you guys. Why not? What else we got going on? Uh, I'm just picking random questions out of the live chat here because, um, yeah. So, uh, Fenica Apologeticus says, what do you think about Schellenberg's hiddenness of God? Um, I can't comment on Schellenberg in particular. Um, so I've heard, you know, the hiddenness argument from different people, uh, both presented and, and rebutted. Um, but I couldn't comment on Schellenberg in particular. I, I'm not well familiar with what he wrote about it. Can't off the top of my head think anything he wrote about it. So I'm just not familiar with it. Maybe I've heard people influenced by him. Didn't know it was him. Lindy Z says, simple question. What are some songs, stories, subjects, etc., to lead children to God? Also, how, um, how to be simple yet factual. In other words, being factual about Noah's Ark to not breed later skepticism. Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So let me tell you what, Linda, you're going to want to catch when I do an inter my interview and people who are interested in the same things Linda is here. You're going to want to catch my interview with Natasha Crane that's coming up. I think it's next week. Let me check my calendar. Let me check my calendar. It's on the 7th, April 7th. So yeah, it's, it's this coming Tuesday. So I'm, I'm interviewing Natasha Crane on her book, um, which is talking to your kids about Jesus. She also has a book called, I, I believe, called Keeping Your Kids on, on God's Side. I guess it's in the other room. I'd show it to you right now. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm excited about that. Now she's done tons of work on this. So I, I recommend you go look up her blog, Christian mom thoughts, I, I, or Christian, Christian mom thoughts. I think that's the name of her blog or, or look up Natasha Crane. And the reason why is because this is what she focuses on. Yeah. It's Christian mom thoughts.com Christian mom thoughts.com. This is what she focuses on Linda. You got to check her out. Look for those kinds of answers there. Not only has she the experience of raising her own kids, but she's networked with groups of parents to try to strategize on what works and what doesn't work and to get really good at this sort of thing. Her whole blog is about helping parents uh, navigate questions like that for their kids. So I'm just going to pass that on to you. Christian mom thoughts. That's who you need. Um, so for the moment, since I'm doing a random Q and a here, what I want you guys to do is not the normal thing where you put Q in, or question in the thing. Cause I might not see that. Cause I'm reading right off the live chat. Um, tag me, go ahead and tag at Mike Winger so that I, your question will pop up to me and I'll to run through some of your questions here. See if we can redeem the time. Um, I do see one from Troy Gomez who says, how do you go about gathering information from scholars, etc., when you researched Bible prophecy with Bible prophecy, it's actually pretty tough because a lot of scholars just don't talk about it. I mean, they just don't mention it at all. And so I, for every, and uh, prophecy, it covers a, such a wide variety of issues that in at one moment you're in the New Testament and at another moment you're 700 years in the past in the Old Testament uh, or even further. And so different scholars are dealing with different content. You, you, you're, you, you have to like just keep looking and you 
the, one of the ways to find scholarship is you look for an article um, and I'm better at this now than I was even a year ago. I, I actually have access to like research databases and things like that that I can use that help. But you look for an article, you look for footnotes, you look for the names that are dropped in the article that talk about, that kind of bring you into the, the scholarly discussion somewhat. But the issue is that a lot of the people don't even talk about it. Like, I'll read a whole commentary from a scholar on, say, Ezekiel, and they literally will not even bring up the prophetic fulfillment uh, or their opinions about those types of things. And I, I think that there tends to be, and maybe I'm wrong here, I think there tends to be a scholarly allergy towards um, supernatural things. And so when you talk about, was this prophecy really fulfilled, that kind of thing, that I I think that there's those who, who tend to be a little allergic to it because it just makes them uncomfortable in their, um, in their scholarly circles when they talk about stuff like that. You'll, you'll notice there's like a language scholars learn, and they learn that even if they have strong beliefs about God and strong beliefs about the supernatural, they're supposed to like sort of like sequester that away from their scholarship and set that aside. There can be some wisdom in that because it can try to provide a little bit an increased objectivity, maybe, but it can also just create a, um, a worldview that's, that's just been cut off, cut in half. And here you are, you, you're evaluating things and content apart from all the evidence, like there's evidence for God. And so we should consider that when we're looking at doing our scholarship, in my opinion, I think the methodological naturalism, uh, as it currently stands in scholarship is just a bad idea. Um, as it currently stands. I think there's a place for something like it, but it's just become philosophical naturalism. It's become beyond a method on how we examine things, you know, how we approach things, looking for a natural cause. Rather, it's assuming a natural cause. That that's that's the mistake. So anyway, there's a thought on that. Um, first last says, can you speak to open theism that God doesn't know the future and people's free will? Uh, shapes the future beyond his knowledge, and if one's view of God's omniscience is an essential. Well, there's a couple of questions there. So open theism, yeah, that's a view, if you guys haven't heard of it, it, it is a view that God um, doesn't really know what's actually going to happen. Now, there's different nuances here, and the thing is about open theists, is they're a very fervent group, the open theists, those who are, they're very fervent, they're very excited and intense about their open theism in some cases, at least the, the vocal ones that I've seen. Um, and they're always saying that everyone's misrepresenting them. And yet, you know what though, it, this is the same thing we hear from everybody. Everyone's always misrepresenting everybody. Um, and, and there's some truth to that, but there's, a, there's another part where it just, it just ends up being, you just don't like the implications of your own views. <laughs> and you say you're misrepresented, but it's really just the implications of your own views. Anyhow, open theism saying, yeah, um, so God can like look into the, into the present and he, uh, he knows things by just observing what's there. And God's constantly learning new things. He's constantly becoming aware of uh, that person made that choice and that happened. Now, now on at least some open theist views that I'm aware of, there's, there's the belief that God knew kind of all the options. He knew all the things you could have chose and he had contingency plans for all of that. And so he didn't know exactly what would happen, but he knew what could happen. And he had an agenda or a plan, kind of like a chess, the, the chess uh, person who says, I'm going to go here. And I know he has 12 options or five good options or three likely options. And I have already got a plan for all three of those likely options or all 10 of those possible options, whatever. So I think scripture utterly refutes this. I think God's more like the chess guy who says, I'm going to go here. I know you're going to go there. I know I'm going to go here. I know you're going to go there. Not because he's controlling those decisions, but because he is uh, already aware of them. So I think that God is a better chess player <laughs> than the open theist does. Um, I don't think that there, there's any good scriptural reason to believe it. And I do intend to do some more work on it in the future. It is interesting to me that open theists as a tendency, that this is a pastoral concern, they tend to also abandon other doctrines, not too long after they become open theists or around the same time. Uh, other doctrines all come into question. There are those who, they take seriously the call to reevaluate their Christian faith and make sure they're biblical, but that doesn't mean they're good at it. And that's a real concern, right? Um, some people, they're, it's like they're safer just believing the traditions they're raised with than they are going into the text themselves because they're just not very good at reevaluating their Christian faith 
and and coming up with biblical conclusions. So I I mean I know that that might sound rude or something, but I do think this is actually happening in, in the online world in particular. Now I'm one who says, yeah, I'm going to reevaluate my faith, but I'll tell you, it, it's laborious and it takes a long time. It, it's <laughs> my cat just failed to jump on the windowsill. <laughs> She's such a gimp. Um, anyway, the uh, the other concern with open theism, though, is um, that it what does it say about the nature of God? when you're saying that he doesn't actually know all things. And so some would say, well, he can't know all things because it's logically impossible that he can. And I think that doesn't make any sense to me. Others would say, uh, no, this is, this is, this is an, a side issue. Open theism is just a total side issue. It feels more than a side issue to me. It's hard to quantify it. It's hard to say how central is this thing, but it seems like it would be a bigger deal than say, um, what form of church government do you think is proper? We'll put it that way. Let's see here. We've, we have a um, uh, question from 412 Kev who says, pre-mill, post-mill, or amill view on end times? So uh, I'm pre-millennial. I, I do think there's an actual millennium that is either a thousand years or, or something like that. You know, if, if, I, I would lean towards thinking that thousand years is an actual thousand years. I'd lean. I don't hold that view like I'm going to die on that hill. But yeah, I think that's the case. Um, so yeah, I'm premillennial. I think that Revelation is 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 a, is speaking of an actual future. I also think it's a book that everybody loves to treat recklessly, and especially like at times like right now with coronavirus, for instance. With coronavirus, I don't I don't think we should be thinking that we're seeing clear fulfillment of prophecy with coronavirus. I think there's a text in scripture that should tell us about this specifically. And this is where, I mean, this is where I'm going to disagree with a lot of online people. I think <laughs> look at what Jesus says. He says, see that no one leads you astray. Okay. There's a danger that will be led astray. This is about coronavirus. Now I'm just jumping off your question onto my own issues. Um, for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and they will lead many astray. Okay. There's a deception. Lots of people saying that Jesus has come when he hasn't come, even claiming that they are the Christ. Well, we've seen this happen so much in the last 2000 years. Even now there's people saying they're Jesus. If someone says they're Jesus. They're lying. End of story, right? How do I know this? Uh, we'll come back to it uh, in a second. How we know that anyone claiming to be Jesus is wrong. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Wait a minute. I thought, Wars and rumors of wars were signs that, that the end is coming. Well, Jesus says exactly the opposite. Wars and rumors of wars should not alarm you. The end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And in one text it adds, I think, pestilences. Um, all these are the beginning of the birth pains. What Jesus is doing in Matthew 24, people think he's giving them a, a roadmap of all the things to look for when his second coming's about to be nigh. But in reality, what he says is, look, it's going to be the normal course of the world that wars, famines, earthquakes, and even pestilences, things like the coronavirus, that these things are going to happen without it indicating that we're at, we're at the last moment. Now, I know this blows up like 20 YouTube prophecy channels, but I think that that's the words of Jesus are really important here. His whole thing is like, see that no one leads you astray. I don't want you to get fooled when you see the normal chaos and destruction that comes into the world. It happens. doesn't mean that it's not God do, using it or doing it, uh, but it, it happens. You know, what, what he then goes on to talk about is the abomination of desolation. That's a sign to look for. That's something to do your homework on. Uh, I think that's something we should, we should care about. And then he talks about how, why we know anyone claiming to be Jesus is wrong, because when Jesus does come back, you're all going to know it, right? For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, right down here, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Everyone's going to see. It's not going to be anything. He's not going to be in the inner rooms. He's not going to be out in the wilderness. Jehovah's Witnesses, he's not in the inner rooms. There's no secret second coming. He's not going to be out in the wilderness somewhere where someone's like, I'm, I'm G Jesus, come follow me. Join my my cult. It's a creepy stuff. Christians don't even need to have a second thought if someone says they're Jesus. They're wrong because everybody would know. Let's see. Um, uh, in pain, we trust in pain. We trust. That's a strange name. 
says, Mike Winger is lying for protection or to get out of a situation bad. Oh, I thought you were saying I was lying. <laughs> I thought, let's talk about where I'm lying. Uh, you're, you're asking, is it, is it okay to lie to be protected or to get out of a bad situation? Rahab lied to get out of a situation and David's wife deceived Saul to protect David. Was that bad? I actually struggle with this question a bit. Um, it seems to me, my current thought, and listen, this is my preliminary thoughts. I'm not sure the right answer on this question. My preliminary thought is that it seems that Rahab is, and I've read the text very carefully, and it seems that she is genuinely commended specifically for having lied to these, uh, the, um, those who don't know the story. Okay. Rahab is in Jericho. Jericho is about to be destroyed by God. They send in spies into Jericho and Rahab houses the spies. She hides them. Now the city guard or officials come by and they're looking for these spies because they're aware that these strangers are in the city and Rahab lies to them and says, oh yeah, they went out that way. So they're hiding in Rahab's house and she sends them out the other way. Hebrews then says, hey, Rahab, you know, by faith, she was doing this by faith when she sent them out the other way. So this seems to be commending her specifically for the lying. Now to me, then we have scripture that says, um, you shall not lie, which specifically is you shall not bear false witness which is, um, which is a little bit more nuanced than, than, a, than a broad statement about lying. So here's my, here's my preliminary conclusion is that specifically in the case where somebody is wrongly trying to kill someone else, wrongly trying to kill someone else, I'm not under obligation to tell them how to find that person. I think that that's true. I think that in the case of, um, of say the Nazis knock on your door and they're like, where are the Jews? And you know where the Jews are and you, and you lie to them. I think that you are honoring God in that scenario. That is my preliminary conclusion. I could be wrong here. I, I've looked at the text. I think it's, I think that that's true. However, what I think people will do with this is they will justify some people. Some people will not walk in the spirit. They will not seek to honor and glorify God. They will seek to find excuses to lie whenever it suits them. I'm going to lie to my boss because if I tell him the real reason I was late, he might fire me. And if he fires me, I lose my job. I lose my income. If I lose my income, I could lose my home. Gosh, I could even die. I'm under great danger so I can tell a lie now. And I say, no, take it on the chin. You, you are not unjustly being persecuted. <laughs> you know, you are lying to cover up your own sin and, and to hide from the consequences of your own issues. That's a very different issue. So I, I think that in the case of when, uh, when someone's unjustly trying to murder or kill someone else, um, I think it's okay to not help them by telling them where that person is. That might be violating another moral law by, uh, by betraying them to their unjust death. Tough stuff to think about. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not the Bible. That's just my current understanding of those texts. Uh, Rob Q says, um, why, why do you think Mary Magdalene was not talk about more in the New Testament? Was not talked about more in the New Testament? Um, well, Rob, I don't know. Questions like that are a bit difficult because what it requires is for us to either get in the mind of the authors or get in the mind of God and try to answer questions where I don't think we probably have a whole lot to go on. Mary Magdalene was talked about only in relation to Jesus. So as much as she related to Jesus, she was mentioned. She's mentioned in a few specific cases, and we just looked into this with Wesley Huff, and I was looking into it on my own as well. So Mary Magdalene uh, is mentioned that seven demons were cast out of her. Okay, that's, we, we don't know that she was a prostitute. We don't know that. That's That's like sort of we don't have that established in the Bible. That's just some people what they think. And it seems like it was a later development. So we don't know that, but we do know that she had seven demons cast out of her, that she helped support Jesus financially. She helped support him financially. I wouldn't expect the prostitutes to be rich enough to do that anyways. And we know that she was a key witness in the, in the burial and resurrection of Jesus. So she's one of these women who are mentioned at the tomb uh, during his burial and his resurrection. And so she's a key witness of, of the authors when they're writing the New Testament. They're sometimes in the Gospels in particular. It seems like they're specifically trying to show you who the witnesses were in certain scenarios at key moments in the ministry of Jesus. In particular, his death and resurrection. That's their key witnesses there. 
So she does come into the story when it relates to Jesus specifically, financially supporting him, his miracle in her life, you know, casting out demons, and her as a witness. Why don't they mention her more? Maybe, maybe my hazardous guess is because other elements about her didn't relate to Christ and didn't relate to the gospel message. That would be my, my thought. All right, let me scroll down a bit. I'm sorry if I'm missing a question from somebody here. Uh, uh, Fenica Apologetica says, what do you think about the hiddenness of God? I think that the hiddenness of God, which is the discussion about, hey, uh, what if there's like a sincere person who's really seeking God and they don't find God? Doesn't that prove that, that God isn't really the way God is described in scripture, where he loves everyone and he wants a relationship with you? Um, Yet there are sincere people who are not finding him. I think that the problem here is that this is, among other things, it's based upon non-believers who are rejecting Christianity, who are telling you how sincere they are. Now, I'm not saying they don't believe that they're sincere. I'm saying that if we're going to take scripture at face value, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. It's not uncommon for people who are walking into deceit to feel totally sincere. This is something that kind of blows us away is when we encounter someone who's totally sincere, but just wrong. That really happens. In Romans 1, it says that God gave them over to a depraved mind. They chose not to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. So if you go to that mind that is in that dark place and you say, are you sincere about your seeking of God? Absolutely I am. I mean this is a difficult thing to prove. So that's the question is, are we, are we actually, if we take the whole text of scripture, what it says about mankind, you know, and God, not just about God, God's love and his provision and his, his care for us and his desire for us to be saved. But if we also take what it says about man and man's depravity and no, I'm not a Calvinist, but man, there is a, there is a, there is a sinful nature in man of some kind of real sinful nature, some kind of re rebellion and rejection of God. When we want sin, we're, we're not only desiring to do bad things, we're actually spiritually responding to the revelation of God. And this brings us into darkness when we choose sin. When I take all that together, it looks like the world today. Like it, that would in a sense, explain the, the divine hiddenness that people are seeing. So yeah, uh, that would be one of the answers to divine hiddenness. There's actually some videos online where, uh, let's see, um, on Capturing Christianity's YouTube channel, there's some content on divine hiddenness. I'm trying to remember who else. I think that Inspiring Philosophy might have some stuff on that too. And they're gonna do it more from a philosophical standpoint. They're gonna have a more thorough answer probably than me. I think the full counsel of scripture seems to give us some good answers to the problem of divine hiddenness. It's just answers people don't like because they find it insulting. But sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. Let's see. Uh, Sarah Zimmerman, uh, one of my super duper mods, says, I struggle with that question when it comes to the Hebrew midwives lying and they're uh, commended. Yeah, the Hebrew midwives, how they... The, so the Hebrew midwives in Egypt, okay, the, the, the Pharaoh said, hey, you know, when a male is born from the Jews, I want you to kill him, right? And they were the midwives that were delivering the babies. So he, he goes, kill him. Well, the midwives didn't do this. Instead, they delivered the babies and then they reported, they lied back to, uh, to the Pharaoh and they said, hey, you know, we're on our way to deliver the babies, but these Hebrew women, man, they're tough. And they just, they just pop out those babies so fast that we're not even able to get there in time to do, to do the work. So they were making excuses. They were making up lies in order to protect these, these, uh, these children. And I mean, you could say, no, that they should have told the truth there. But I think here we have, again, another example in scripture that seems to be supportive of in that one type of situation where you're saving someone from a murder, that it, it seems to support lying in that scenario. Yeah, now, that's, I, I recognize that that's a challenging thing. I just, that seems to be what the text is saying to me. All right, here's a question from David Ackerman. He says, uh, do you think that a lot of this, the disagreements of predestination, free will, and Calvinism are mostly due to us humans trying to systematize how God's end of the equation works? Well, in a sense, they are. Um, but it, 
it seems to be more than that to me. Um, the Calvinism is a very thoughtful system. It's a very cohesive system in many ways. It might have some internal issues there, but there, but in, in a lot of ways, it's this like logical. It's a it's a construct that in and of, in and of itself is like relatively consistent. It's pretty consistent, and I think that logical like tightness appeals to people. But my my concern with Calvinism is is not just the logical tightness of the system. It's that I think that there's things in it that are not biblically grounded. And so I think it needs, we need a different system if we're going to reflect scripture accurately. That's my view. I know I have many Calvinists who watch that. I love you guys and you love, some of you love, most of you love me, (laughs) even though you think I'm wrong on this. And that's fair. This is an in-house discussion. It really is. And and those who think it's not, I think you're gravely, gravely mistaken. Yeah. So I, I do think the disagreements there are important. Um, all of us should affirm predestination though. Every one of us should affirm predestination. There's, there's, I don't see how anybody can not affirm that and be a Bible believing Christian. The question is what is predestination mean? And what are the implications of predestination on human free will? Do we still have a free will decision? And I see no conflict here at all. I, I, it's, it's difficult for me because I literally don't see the conflict. I have to try to be like, why do you have a problem with this again? And I have to try to see the conflict from other people's side and then try to respond to it. But yeah, yeah, I've been one of those who just hadn't, didn't really struggle with that much. Yeah. I think Calvinism though, what it ends up doing is creating some strange things like regeneration before faith, or I should say you're regenerated. Um, and your faith is a result of your regeneration. Put it that way. Think about that. Your faith is a result of your regeneration. I think that's one of the weak spots in the whole Calvinist system. And I think it's because they treat faith as a work. I have that, you know, this is careful on this. In my video on this uh, online, people regularly misunderstand what I'm saying here. Uh, I'm not saying that Calvinists are running around going, faith is a work, faith is a work. What I'm saying is um, the justification for why they think regeneration has to precede faith is because they think that if it doesn't, if faith precedes regeneration, then faith is now a work, effectively a work that you're doing in order to um, commend yourself to God in some sense, that sort of thing. I, I think that that's the mistake. And if faith is not a work, regardless of whether it comes purely from God or, or from God and man, man also choosing to trust the Lord, if faith's not a work, even in that scenario, then we don't need this regeneration before faith thing. It's just unnecessary. There we go. Starting fires. <laughs> All right. Uh, Travis Popple says, why do you prefer ESV over other translations? Um, I do use the ESV right now, and I don't know which translation I like the best. I really don't even know. And part of the reason is because translations cover the entire Bible, and sometimes you have a committee working in the Old Testament that's different than the New Testament. And in, in the Old Testament in particular, I think I prefer the New King James, whether I'm right or wrong. I think I prefer the New King James, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's, maybe I shouldn't prefer that. Um, with the ESV, I, the reason why I use the ESV currently, uh, predominantly, at least in live streams, over, say, the New King James is because the ESV in particular um, has handled certain tough passages well in my opinion. And what I'm, what I'm talking about here, caring a lot about apologetics is Mark 16, John chapter eight, first John chapter five, where it talks about the, 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 the Trinitarian passage there. These passages I think are like landmines if you don't understand what you're looking at. And I thought the ESV produced content that very simply and, and broke it down well for believers in their, in their literature. So I, I just liked that. That was one of the reasons why I, I just... I like the ESV. It is a good translation. It's it's pretty literal, fairly literal. Nothing's there's no truly perfectly literal translations. Nor do you want one, to be honest. That wouldn't be understandable. So, yeah, I like the ESV, but I use multiple translations: ESV, NASB, New King James, and sometimes on tough passages, I'll scroll through twelve or thirteen translations just to see the different views they have. So yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. I do have a video on translations you guys can look up. Just type Mike Winger translations and it should pop up. Looking for more questions. If y'all have any, just tag me in there. Um, Mike, is the preacher John Barnett 
from a Calvary Chapel. Greetings from Germany. Love your teaching, bro. Keep up the great work. Cool, man. Good. To, I'm glad I had a live stream where someone in Germany can even watch while it's live, which is a rare thing for us. Um, John Barnett. I've never heard of John Barnett. I don't know who John Barnett is, so couldn't tell you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just don't know. And for those who who've just joining us, Peter Williams was my guest today. We couldn't get the tech stuff worked out. We're going to postpone his interview for a couple days at least. Get the tech stuff worked out. I need a better interview solution. I thought I had a great one, but it seems like it just keeps causing people issues. And I'm going to take blame for that. It, it's going to be my job to make sure that people I interview don't have to have tech savvy in order to start an interview with me. They, they, they just need, you know, Bible knowledge. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. So, so yeah. Question from uh, Mina Mahal. Oh, I see a few questions here. Um, Mina Mahal says, have you ever read anything by Watchman Lee? What's your opinion on him? I haven't. I've heard nice things about him. Have no personal experience with the guy or his work. Um, yeah, someone gave me one of his works a long time ago, but I didn't read it. So I'm sorry, I can't, can't answer that one. Travis says, thank you. And I say, you're welcome, sir. Uh, Daniel Renfro says, question, do you know how to support Paul being the last apostle biblically? Um, yes. Well, we can start with the negative case. Uh, at least I'm going to give a few thoughts off the top of my head. Keep in mind, this is not my, my thoughtful sit down research and give you a response moment, but Paul being the last apostle. Here's the, here's the first thought. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, let me ask you a question. Before I answer your question, Daniel, I want you to comment again, tag me in it, and answer if you're asking about Paul being, there being no apostles after Paul, or if you're asking about whether Paul was legitimately an apostle, please clarify that question for me. And I'll, I'll answer something else while I'm waiting for you to do that. All right, we have a question from, well, we just had a bunch of them come in. So let me, I'm scrolling around looking, trying to figure this out. We have uh, Big Yehuda. Big Yehuda says, please pray for me. I was born with a compromised immune system. Love your work. You're bringing so much good counsel to us all. All right, Big Yehuda. You guys, you guys hear that? If you, if you would uh, remember Big Yehuda in your prayers, um, not only for his compromised immune system uh, in general, but specifically because right now that's got to be bringing you some potential anxiety and understandably uh, remember to cast your cares before the Lord and that our hope is such that cannot be overcome by illness cannot be overcome by death. Uh, it overcomes death. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, God bless you. Uh, Chris Seekley says Abrahamic covenant versus new covenant, both saving. If so, why the law? Uh, yeah. So Abrahamic covenant versus new covenant. Well, I mean, the new covenant kind of falls in a sense under the Abrahamic covenant. It's a fulfillment of it because the Abrahamic covenant w was also a promise about the future. So the law does this as well. The law is leading to something. So I, it's not like we see just perfectly separated covenants. It's like we see covenants leading to the new covenant. So yeah, the, the, the idea that Abraham was saved by faith is established in Romans chapter four. It talks about how Abraham was saved. He was saved by faith. It talks about how then God had overlooked transgressions that were before, that were under, during those times. He, he passed over them, overlooked them for the time that he might justify those same people in Christ. So Abraham was justified by Jesus Christ. The covenant with him was about pointing to Christ and him trusting in that covenant that led to Christ was part of his faith. Um, let's see. Wendy says, ever check out the KJVER, King James Version Easy Read. I love it. I have not checked it out. Uh, I haven't seen it. But those seem like, it seems like a, like an oxymoron. King James Version, easy read. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I like King James Version. I've never struggled with that English for some reason. It just clicks for me. I get it. Um, I like it, but, but, uh, but I just can't imagine it being an easy read. How, I wonder how much they had to change it. Uh, Abrahamic, Chris Seekley says, Abrahamic covenant versus new covenant, both saving. If so, oh, I already asked, did that question. Miss T, I have a very clean sense of humor, but yesterday my pastors made it clear that I need to be more serious to be effective. Is it true that saved people must be serious? Um, well, I mean, I think we should be serious when we should be serious. I, th I think it's a mark of folly to mock or joke about everything. I think that's a mark of, of folly. 
and it's it's it yeah <laughs> that's my opinion my personal opinion here but i also think humor is good uh laughter is medicine scripture says like it 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 it, it it's good it's healthy for us I, I i'm enjoying some of the memes that we're seeing even in the midst of coronavirus and all the all the anxiety that's causing lots of people man the memes are uh, are are sometimes sometimes they're not i don't like them at all so other times i'm like that's funny that's good i like that and it's it's fun to laugh about things and to to have a good time but yeah we should be serious when we need to be serious not sure if i know how to answer that better than that uh Jaden Havener says, please help explain Genesis 3.16. People use this to defend replacement theology. Galatians 3.16, sorry. So Galatians 3.16, sometimes when I hear the references, I'm like, oh, I know what, but I don't know where this is coming. So now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Um, How would they defend replacement theology? Replacement theology is God's done with Israel and the church is the new Israel. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. Then he says, this is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. I, I'm sorry, but I don't see the force of this for replacement theology. I think they might be going beyond the text. I think we're talking about tracing salvation to the same way that Abraham was saved, which was by faith, and that the law came along as a tutor or schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, but not as a method of salvation. So it's, it, that's what I think this passage is about. I don't think it's related to the, uh, the role of Israel. I think if you want to talk about the role of Israel in future prophecy, I think you should go to Romans. Uh, Romans is going to talk about that where it says that all Israel will be saved. And it talks about this future time of Israel, you know, being restored in, in Romans um, 11, I believe it is. And I do have a, a verse by verse study through Romans 11, several, a few videos through Romans 11 in my Romans series online. If you just type Mike Winger, Romans 11, maybe pop up. But yeah, so that, that would be the passage I would go to. There's a lot of questions, so I'm going to move a little quicker here. Still looking for that follow-up um, from uh, the other question we had earlier. John Engler says, Can you please give us a quick overview of your live streaming setup? We love your Bible skills, and now we also need your tech skills. Thank you so much for your ministry. I was thinking about doing a video sometime soon, uh, like within the next week, where I just walk through like a quick and dirty way to do a live stream. So thinking about doing that, or to do uh, videos online. I think that it can get complicated pretty quick. I have a more complicated setup than I used to. So I was thinking about giving a simple way of doing it. So yeah, I'm considering doing that. But if you get like a C922 webcam, that that is Log Logitech webcam C922, that's the one I started with. It's like 90 bucks and you just need a lot of light. Like bring every, every lamp, open the window. If, well, window light can be questionable because if a cloud comes over, it changes the whole setup. So it's better to use, you know, non-natural light you can control, but bring tons and tons of light, like more light than you are comfortable with. And then that webcam will look decent. Until then it will look junk. But when you put a ton of light on you, it looks decent. Um, you have that, you need to get a good microphone. This is a really good microphone. But what I started with was a um, Blue Yeti, Y-E-T-I, Blue Yeti. And that is a good microphone. Just know that it's, it's not like this microphone. You don't point it at your face like that. Read the instructions. You, you talk while well, the microphone's like this, not like that. You talk towards kind of the mute button on that microphone. Everybody gets that wrong. Everybody. So there's a, there's the two things I had. That just plugs in with a USB. Both these just go USB into your computer. And then you can just like go onto YouTube, get a YouTube channel and, and go live just like that. You wouldn't even need anything else if you just want to show your camera on screen. That's a quick, dirty setup. Um, do, do, do. Daniel James says, as a Calvinist, I think you're great. Thanks, Daniel. That's awesome, man. I had a buddy who sent me a message the other day saying that in a Calvinist forum, they were debating about me. And I was like, what? And he says, well, someone said, you're, you know, someone posted something about one of your videos. And then someone said, he's, he's not a Calvinist. And someone said, yeah, but I still like some of his content. And, and I'm like you, I'm able to listen to someone and go, I disagree with you here, but I can still learn from you over here. 
And I think it's healthy if we can be in that place where we don't have to only have teachers who agree with us completely. We sort of cut us up, cut ourselves off from a lot of great resources when we do that. So Nibu says, uh, Scaria says, what is your take on hell? Do you believe it is a place of eternal torment? I do think it is. Um, I, I don't, I would never use the word torture. I think it's, I think the experience is select to the individual. It doesn't necessarily have to be static. I don't know if it gets worse, gets better at some point. I don't, these are questions I don't have answers to. And I don't want to try to say I do. I do think though that it lasts forever and the person is conscious in some sense forever. So it's eternal and conscious and it's torment in the sense that it's unpleasant, but it's perfectly just measured exactly what they should have. Uh, but I am open to rethinking that position, but I am not in a hurry to do so, nor am I going to be driven by modern um, moral attacks against Christianity, moral challenges to Christianity to rethink my theology on this issue. I think there's an underlying issue that's bigger, which is whether we, tr whether we, um, whether we really believe that God is a just judge. Because there are those who think, well, gosh, if and, and this is not you, I don't think probably Nibu, but there are many who think if hell's eternal conscious torment, then God's unjust. And I just think this is like, this is so foolish. This is, this is so demonstrably foolish. You, you're, you're thinking in the real world that you have the ability to, to discern where God is morally wrong as you look at it from a thousand miles away and as you piece together what you think God is doing and you say, and that's morally wrong. I'm more moral than God. My moral judgments are better than God. This is, to me, this is just like utter insanity. That is a bigger issue than the nature of hell is that posture where we think we can judge God. I think that is so foolish. I think great, great wisdom here is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I, I, I just want to imagine these people who say this, who are Christians, who say this, that if they stand before God and God says, I just want you to know, um, hell is eternal conscious torment and it's perfectly just. And this is my job. I wonder if they're going to look at God and be like, no, it's not. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong, God. You know, <laughs> I don't actually need these. <laughs> I have no interview today. So I, I, I wonder if they would do this and I, if, if they would see the, the folly of this kind of thinking. The question is, what is God, what has God revealed to us that he's going to do? I already know it's just because God is just. And I think that's a, I think that's the only wise philosophical position to take. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm, I'm, I know I've skipped a few here, so I apologize for that. Um, Karen Campbell says, can you give a quick summary of the Trinity in first John, please. So there's a passage in first John. I think it's five, um, seven. Okay. Let me show it to you in the new King James version. Make it big. Okay, it's here in verse, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now, this is often taken as like the proof text for the Trinity for many people. Um, but here's the concern. We have lots of different manuscripts of our, of our New Testament, uh, early manuscripts of the Bible. And in these manuscripts, they don't all say the same thing. This shouldn't, this shouldn't be news to the church, right? But this is news to a lot of people. This doesn't threaten my faith. This doesn't mean the Bible's unreliable. These are, these are obnoxious overreactions, obnoxiously overreacting to the information here. What it does mean is that there's times, and it's been this way for hundreds of years, even when they made the King James Version, they have to select between two different manuscripts that have different readings, or I should put it more like it is now between whole groups of manuscripts who have various readings on different passages. And the variant reading here is the father and the word and the Holy spirit. Uh, and I think the phrase in heaven, they're all in, in later manuscripts, not in earlier manuscripts. And there's general agreement. This is not really controversial. There's general agreement among scholars that though that section does not actually belong in first John originally. Here's, here's, here's how the ESV renders it, and most modern translations put it, put it this way. See how short verse 7 is? For there are three that testify. That's it. And then it says the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. 
in the New King James and in some manuscripts, it says, for there are three, many manuscripts, but later ones, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. So that phrase, from in heaven all the way down to there, that whole highlighted section, probably not original. It may have been like, I'm just guessing here, I could be wrong. It may have been like it was a scribe wrote it on the side note column, like sometimes a way to add theological commentary on the side. A later scribe thought, wait, was that commentary or was that a, an emendation saying this belongs in the text? It's possible that it got imported into the text for that reason. That's always a possibility. Um, I don't remember the details of this exact passage about how many manuscripts it's in or what the story is. Only, oh, okay, so it, here I'm reading a footnote. Only four or five very late manuscripts contain these words in Greek. So this is this is probably why there's so much agreement on it. It's been a while since I looked into this. Only four or five manuscripts. So, it's, so it has very weak attestation in the, in the manuscript tradition. We have tons of manuscripts, only four or five, and they're very late. So it probably doesn't belong there. What, now, what is the implications for the Trinity, for the doctrine of the Trinity? Uh, none. Uh, the implications for the doctrine of the Trinity are don't use that verse. That's it. Uh, other than that, there are no implications because we have massive support biblically for the doc doctrine of the Trinity. We just aren't going to use that particular verse to support it. It has no effect on the doctrine of the Trinity. That's the short version. Honest Conversation says, John the Baptist, Jesus, and even uh, apostles deep into Acts were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Are we wrong to neglect this is this in the gospel? I don't understand your uh, your question too well because I don't know what you mean by gospel of the kingdom. I think that we are preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I think that they didn't understand early on in the gospels what that even meant, even though they were preaching it. I think that's clear in, the, in this in scripture. In my Mark series, we're going through that. The disciples didn't get it. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Didn't really get it. John preaching it didn't fully get it. Right? Jesus, he's healing people, but he's not coming in like a military victor. And John's like are you the one or do we wait for another? So it's clear they were teaching something they didn't fully understand. So the full understanding of it comes in the whole light of the whole gospel. Jesus is the one who understands it. Jesus is the one who's walking them through it. And finally, he's, he's going to the cross, even though the disciples are like, no, he's like, I must. So they didn't fully understand it. We do now. And I don't think we're neglecting that gospel. Um, I think the kingdom is, is you're going to be part of God's kingdom. Now, if you're talking about um, it, focusing on earthly things instead of eternal things, I think that that would be a mistake for us. I think that we're in, we're encouraged strongly to focus on eternal things in our um, in our pursuit of bringing people to the truth of Christ. Eternal things that have massive earthly effect, but their focus is not upon the earth. Their focus is on on eternity, not just heaven, not just sky stuff. Right? Eternity, eternity, new heaven, new earth. That that would be the focus. Ashley Armstrong says, should we be worried about vaccine since ID 2020 can be, can place a chip in us? I don't know anything about that, Ashley. I saw the a headline on that. All I know is this, is that but since coronavirus stuff has gone crazy, um, everyone, a lot of people have put up all kinds of crazy, nutty, weird stuff, articles online. I'm not saying that what you're, what you're saying is wrong. I've, I have no comment about it, but in general, Facebook, I'm seeing images of Jesus supposedly in the clouds, spaceships up in the clouds, visions of heaven supposedly. These are just like photoshopped, video edited footage that's coming from anonymous sources and being people are hosting watch parties on Facebook of it. And I'm like, I'm like, oh man, it just, it just, it makes me want to bang my head against the wall when I see some of this stuff. The way some, some minority of Christians are responding to the coronavirus is, is telling that that they are, they're going off half cocked, right? That, that is like a, a gun analogy, right? When they're, they're going off, they, they don't really know what they're talking about in many cases. They're just guessing. And the sad thing is many of them, I think, don't care if they're wrong. Uh, it looks to me like the government's doing really this, and this is what's really going on. And then they're, I want you to save their posts and then throw it back at them a year later and be like, were you right? Because you were inciting all kinds of fear and panic. And I just wanted to know if you were right or not. Be wise, my Christian friends. Be wise. We're we are the salt of the earth. We are not the um, the catalyst of fear and terror. We are meant to speak truth. And if truth involves fear and terror, fine, so be it. But some people are just excited about bad news. Anyway, just a little rant from, you, from me. I don't usually rant. Uh, Stub a Dub has a question. Hey, buddy, man, I remember you. 
Uh, we met not long ago. Uh, does Matthew 10, 28 support the view that sinners do not live in hell for eternity? Matthew 10, 28. Let's look at that passage and I may be ill-equipped to answer this, uh, but we're going to look at it together and just talk about it for a minute. Because I haven't done my thorough study on this topic. I do have, um, I have it in the other room too as well. I do have um, Fudge's book on, on hell, and I'd like to compare that with whoever I can find who's like the best responder to his content, the best thoughtful person to respond to his content, and we'll go, go at it then. So do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul, or both soul and body in hell. Um, yeah, so I... Okay, the, the question is, and this is where part of the debate between the eternal conscious torment folks and the conditionalist, conditional immortality folks is, is what does death mean? And I think that they want, forgive me if this is clumsy, you guys, this is just my current understanding. I think that they want to say that death means you, you don't exist anymore. You don't exist anymore. But I think that as we survey the use of the word death or kill in the text of scripture, we find that the concept of death doesn't always mean you don't exist anymore. Right? It doesn't always mean that. And I think that that's actually a big weak point in the etern the uh, conditionalist argument. If it always means, and in this case means, that you stop existing, well, then you you no longer exist when this happens to you. Right? He destroys his body and soul in hell. If, however, it doesn't mean that, if death means something more than ceasing to exist, then it, it means that God can give the death sentence to your soul and your body, not just, not just the, um, not just one or the other. All right. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call, but it's going to have to wait. Brief response right there. The real debate is on death. It's not on Matthew 10, 28. It's, it's like a debate happens somewhere else. And then that you project that onto the, onto the text of Matthew 10, 28. I do think Jesus makes, seems to give us reason to think that this, um, the experience in hell is a longer lasting experience than uh, eternal conscience, then you would have to think it is if you take the, the um, conditionalist view of Matthew passage there. Sorry if that's confusing. Uh, Grace Abound says, question Psalm 91, when Jesus says not to tempt God, did he mean that Satan shouldn't try to test Jesus or that Jesus shouldn't jump as Satan suggested because that is testing God the Father? I think it's the second one. I, th I think there, it seems to be pretty clear. Satan tempts him, hey, Jesus, uh, jump off this, this, this high precipice and God will protect you because then he quotes Psalm 91. Get that Psalm 91, what people are quoting today, uh, some people about coronavirus. And he's like, God will protect you. You don't have anything to fear. He's going to, his angels will give charge over you. Won't let you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus says, it is written, do not tempt the Lord your God. I think he's talking about jumping off this thing while God promised to protect me. Yes, but you're just trying to get me to foolishly behave in, in dangerous ways, which is tempting God to not protect me because I'm being a fool. So that uh, same thing about coronavirus and gathering in large numbers of people right now. I think that when someone says Psalm 91, I think we should respond by saying, do not tempt the Lord your God. <laughs> and you're in good footing because that's what Jesus said. Um, are you, uh, this is from Daniel James. Are you able to get Dr. Chris Sinkinson on who studies his PhD in religious pluralism? I, I've never heard of Chris, um, so I'm, I don't know. Um, sorry, Daniel, I'm, I haven't heard of him and I, I don't have any plans on that one way or the other. Stubby Dub has another question. Does Matthew 10, 28 support the view that sinners... Was that the same question? I don't know. My screen just popped. Like I just lost my spot. That happens a lot with the live chat. I, I wish it wouldn't. Well, Stubby Dub, it was probably a really good question, but I, I don't even know how, how far I just zoomed down. I could have just zoomed down a few pages. I'm going to move forward. It might've been the same question again, actually, because we were in Matthew 10, 28. Yeah. Um, Jay Lowry says, does John 8, 1 through 11, the woman caught in adultery belong in the Bible? Isn't it the oldest and isn't it in the oldest and best manuscripts? John 8? Um, I, I would think no. Um, and I do have a video where I talk about this. I'm looking for... Hmm. All right. This is one of those passages where I thought the ESV's notes were very helpful. And I wonder if... 
I don't think I can access them in the, in the online version. I think I'd need, I'd need the, the study Bible, ESV study Bible, which I don't have in this room. All my books are in another room. This is not my only bookshelf. <laughs> um, we have bookshelves in every, in every room of the house, just about. Um, anyway, the John 8 is the story of the woman caught in adultery. It, it seems to me, my, my, my observation, and it's not through, like, I'm not the textual critic. I'm not the guy who's sitting there combing through all the manuscripts, doing all that hard work. We're benefiting from their hard labors. And the conclusion that they have offered to us that I think sounds reliable is that John 8, 1 through 11, is not originally part of John. Some of the reasons they give are that uh, in the manuscript tradition, we see it, it's not in John in many places. In other places, it's in different places in John. Like it's a story that they, that they really wanted to preserve, but that it wasn't part of John. Um, another argument is that John seems to flow better without 8, 1 through 11, seems to flow better without it. And so this is, um, these are some of the reasons why, that they give for why we probably w- didn't see this in the original writing of John. Well, the question is, what is it? Where does this content come from? And um, I think it was Dan Wallace, who's a highly respected uh, scholar in this field, highly respected. And it was him who said, it may be that this is like a, an actual tradition about Jesus that was floating around that the people wanted to preserve and they didn't know where to put it. So they stuck it in there. In that case, it would be an extra biblical uh memory of Christ, which means we don't treat it as canon. We treat it as not canon, interesting story, and we don't build our theology on that passage. Now, the the biggest challenge here, two challenges are one, if you grew up thinking that this passage is part of inspired scripture, this this could just emotionally offend or wound you. And that's a real issue. That to me is a, a real significant and serious issue. I think if once you go watch my video on this topic on the, um, uh, I have three videos in a series. Maybe one of the uh, mods can put this in the live chat right now. I have three videos in a series that give the um, the explanation. It's in a playlist on YouTube of variations in the text. Uh, how much has changed, supposedly changed? Can we really trust what we have in our record here? And the bottom line is that this is not unknown to scholarship. This is just recently being discovered on more of a pop level. Like we're finding out stuff that's been known for a very long time. In fact, if you open a Bible you own in the footnotes in John 8, it will tell you about this problem unless you have no footnotes, which is you should have, your Bible should have footnotes. So you should be aware of those kinds of things. Um, Yeah, we don't build any great theology on this passage. It may well be a true story about Jesus that just wasn't part of canon, but was so loved as it is today that they wanted to preserve it. So they kept putting it alongside the scripture and eventually found its place into John 8. There's a, there's a couple thoughts for you. And yeah, the ESV study Bible has a really good summary of this in a way that I thought was accessible, better than the summary I just gave you. Um, Sarah Zimmerman, can you play a worship song for us on your guitar? No, I can't. <laughs> for a couple reasons, though. One reason is that uh, copyright music, even if you just sing it online, even playing it live, it can very quickly get flagged and get you into copyright trouble on YouTube. Also, um, I don't really want to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm, it would be that good. Um, let's see. Slam RN says you need to tag Mike Winger. Yes, yeah, so he can see your question. This is true. This is true. Okay. Um, oh man, it just bumped again. What is up with this stuff? I lost. Just lost some stuff. Um, this is the live chat. I'm watch. I'm watching it. So, please tell me if it's okay. This is Deborah. Deborah Van Dusen. If it's okay for a pastor to teach Calvinism, doesn't it matter how we come to salvation? Yes, but Calvinism isn't, some Calvinists might say you have to preach Calvinism to preach the gospel. And I'm like, no, you don't. Even if you, even if Calvinism is true, you don't need to preach Calvinism dis- distinctives in order to preach the gospel. You need to preach the gospel of Christ that we're saved by grace alone through, through faith alone. I mean, you need to talk about repentance and faith for forgiveness. That's the deal, right? I, I repent of my sin. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection. I believe in your heart. Um, believe in the Lord Jesus, right? And, and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead. So then we've got this, um, I think I mixed up <laughs> from Romans 10. I think I mixed that all up. But th- yeah, we've got this um, uh, this simple faith and trust in Christ that we need to preach. And it does involve repentance. Repentance is part of the gospel. It doesn't mean living a perfect life from here on out. Like that's the requirement for being saved. But it, it's an attitude of turning from sin towards God. It's just part of what faith is. It's your attitude. 
do you, do you have to have Calvinism? Do I have to teach that regeneration precedes faith to do that? Do I have to teach people total depravity or uh, perseverance of the saints in order for them to know the gospel? I think that's totally wrong. And um, Daniel Renfro says, I know Paul is a true apostle, but I don't know how to support him being the last apostle. So, okay, here's the clarity on the earlier question. Daniel's like, hey, um, how do I show that there's no more apostles after Paul? Um, well, let me, th this deserves a way more careful and systematic response than what I can give you right now. I would encourage you to do some homework on this. Like go, if you haven't done it yet, Daniel, maybe this is a topic you should go Google. This is well-trod territory. People have talked about this and written on this. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the answers and the arguments that go into it. A couple of the things that I'm thinking of right now is that, um, we don't see in the text of scripture any encouragement that there's going to be any future apostles. We see that the apostle's job was to lay the foundation and the foundation has been laid. Like this is a past tense event. And we see uh, him commending, for instance, in Galatians and other places, he's commending people and the apostles in general are commending people that they have to stick to the word they've already received, whether it be by word or by or by letter from them, that they need to, people need to stick to the gospel they've already received from the apostles, that that foundation is laid and that's like a permanent thing. They had a unique task and job that was accomplished then. So if there is any sense in which there are apostles, it's in a different sense than, than what uh, the 12 or, you know, or 13, depending on how you count these guys, right? Because we have, um, we have, myth, myth, uh, what is it in Acts chapter one? Um, Matthias? No. What was, his, what was his name? I'm blanking on his name of the uh, apostle who, who came in to take over Judas's place. Um, yeah, Matthias, but not Matthias, Matthias. So Matthias comes in and then we have Paul the apostle who comes in. So we've got these guys, they lay the foundation. I think the task is done. We have no reason to think that there's some other apostles. One of the requirements of being an apostle, here's an important part. Paul talks about this in, in Corinthians. Uh, is it first or second Corinthians? where he talks about like how he's sort of proving that he's really legitimately an apostle. It involves being an eyewitness of Jesus, an eyewitness of Jesus after his resurrection. And this seems to be something that we wouldn't really expect to continue to happen right now. Um, when people do have visions of Christ, they're not being called to apostleship. They're usually just being called to salvation. Muslims seeing Jesus getting saved. This doesn't make them apostles, but it seemed to have been one of the requirements, this, this sort of calling like that. So yeah, it seems to me this is the kind of thing that that, that is that was for a time and it's and it's over now. In that in that capital A apostle sense. Luke the Luke Skywalker too says, "Do you have any advice for reading Job?" Um, I recommend yeah, sure. Reading Job, uh, you need to read the whole book in context of the whole book, right? You, you you need to read everything in context of the last few chapters where God speaks to Job and Job is then has this restoration that happens. That would be my first piece of advice. My second is realize that the, the long, the majority of Job is a discussion between Job and his friends. And this is not particularly, not that there's no theology here, but it's not particularly meant to teach theology. That's not like the design and goal. Job and his friends, except for Elihu, who speaks way later, he speaks after all the friends speak at the end of the book, except for him, Job and all his friends, they're all re uh, refuted by God, like it's stated in Job that they spoke foolishly. So that's why we have to be very careful how we read their content. So what, what, what Job and his friends reveal to us is man's heart. And if you watch, and if you read the speeches in Job, at least the, the way I do, is I look at the heart of man. I see Job and what his heart is going through during his suffering and his friends and how they're processing Job's suffering and how they're responding. And you want to follow the big picture flow of argument in the speeches. So you could read, say, like Job's first speech and just summarize in a sentence. What is his point? And then read the next response to him and summarize what is their point. That would be like an interesting way to read Job. That's what I've done is I did a survey of the book. Is like what was the flow, the big picture flow, as opposed to looking at it as though it's a New Testament epistle trying to give you like compact theology in single verses. There is theology in Job, but in particular in the debate between him and his buddies, except for Elihu, you're, you're not going to find um, as ironclad of a case for theology in those passages. From Joe Tink1 says, question, Mike, would you go on the unbelievable show with Justin Brierley? 
Um, I would definitely consider it. Um, the truth is I don't like debates and it's a debate platform. I just don't like doing debates and it's something that I've, I've done in the past because I'm like, well, if there's fruit for the kingdom, but I don't know if I'm particularly good at it, to be honest, to be totally frank with you. Maybe I could get better at doing debates perhaps. Um, or maybe I need a certain format for me to function well. I'm not really a, a combative person and that actually helps in debate. If you're just like sort of a sharp, chin, just go at them and keep going and keep going and keep going. Usually when people become combative, I'm just like, I'm just done with this conversation. I don't want to talk to this person anymore. This is not fruitful, but you obviously can't do that in a debate. I'm done. Um, at any rate, maybe that means choosing better debate partners than some people I've had in the past. Uh, maybe, maybe there's some wisdom there. So I, but I'd be, I'd be willing to at least pray about it and consider it. Um, and I've actually met Justin and talked to him in person and he mentioned having me on the show and it's probably my fault for not following up because I just would yeah, I'm not sure if I want to do it. <laughs> so I need to pray about that. AJ Bernard says, um, Logos has the ESV study Bible as an add-on for your ESV text. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Good to know. I can, I, I can add that. Uh, Josie Smith says, um, hi, Josie, by the way, I remember you. Josie Smith says, second John 10, 11, 10 through 11. If someone comes to you, not with the doctrine of Christ, do not greet or bring in the house. Would you elaborate? It sounds like we are not to invite any non-Christians into our home. Oh, this is a great question, Josie. I'm glad you asked it. All right. Let's go to the text, guys, because this is a passage I think that's frequently uh, misunderstood. And because of that, we like apply it too much. Uh, we apply it, I don't mean too much, like, you know, but you can't apply the Bible too much, but we apply it incorrectly. We apply it to things it doesn't apply to is really what I'm saying. All right. Um, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, what's this teaching? Um, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides uh, in the teaching has both the father and the son. This, so it's talking about the basic doctrines of Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. So like those sort of essential Christian truths. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So the wrong way to apply this, I think, is to say, if you're not a Christian, you cannot come into my home. <laughs> if you don't bring the teaching of Christ, you can't come into my home. That is definitely not the case, fortunately. Um, what this is talking about is hospitality in a much bigger sense. It's talking about, uh, so there's two problems. One is we don't really, as the hospitality, it means is housing people, not just inviting them in, but housing them and feeding them in the context of them being a traveling speaker, someone who goes from town to town and they say, I have messages, I'm a minister of the gospel and I'm going to come to you and I want to, you're going to house me, you're going to provide for me while I deliver my messages to the, to the community here. That would be like the normal thing. We, we do this in a little bit now, right? We, we, when we invite speakers, sometimes pastors are calling church members, hey, can you house them and feed them? Can you take care of them while they're here for a few days? That's the same context. So the context is, if this person is preaching for the false gospel, if they are, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mormonism, that kind of thing, and they're like, will you house and take care of me while I propagate my false gospel? The answer is no, of course I will not. That's, that's the context here. Um, this, now, if a Jehovah's Witness person comes to your door and you invite them into the house to have a conversation with them and to reach them, that's not the same thing. I don't think you're violating this passage because don't receive them into your house or give them any greeting. Um, I think... You could take it very literally. You can't even greet them. You can't even acknowledge them. I think what it means is greeting them as a brother and taking them into your home to provide for them while they, while they do their teachings. That's my understanding of the passage. It does have application, but we don't want to, we don't want to do it wrong. Daniel K says, is it okay to take promises from the old Testament knowing that they were addressed to Israel, um, individuals in a particular context? And you give an example. So let's look at this particular example. Deuteronomy 28, 13. And you said, thank you for your ministry. And I am privileged and honored uh, for any blessing. Any blessing it brings into your life is a tremendous joy to me. Deuteronomy 28, 13. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall go, you shall only go up and not down. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you today, being careful to do them. Yeah, I think this is difficult to apply into our lives because it's specifically to Israel. This is a good example. Um, I think we have to take them on a case by case basis, right? So apply it directly into your life. No, this is for Israel. This is specifically if they obey the law of the old Testament, 
right? That law, which I command you today, who's the you? The you is Israel. And they were commanded the law at that time in Deuteronomy. This is, this is them meaning blessings and curses, right? As they're heading into the land. So this is important that we understand the context. He says he'll make them the head and not the tail. That's not even an individual thing. This is a corporate thing. He's going to make the nation of Israel the head and not the tail. The nation of Israel will, will prosper and do well as, as part of a works-based system, which they fail and fail and fail until Jesus accomplishes it for them. And when they receive Christ, then there will be some application of this into their, into their lives. And there will, in the millennial kingdom, be this. There will be the head and not the tail. In my opinion, that's the fulfillment of this uh, ultimately. Now, how do I apply this into my life? Um, I think what you do is you say, in principle, in principle, I don't want to use ungodliness to accomplish my goals because I know God is capable of accomplishing his goals in my life in, in godliness. So I'm not going to compromise with sin to accomplish what I want to have done. I'm going to say, you know what, Lord, if this is part of your will for my life, then it can be done with righteousness. I don't need to, uh, I don't need to plot. I don't need to de deceive people about these things. I need to walk in righteousness. Yeah. That would be my application. So I, I take a principle, a really broad principle that seems to be enacted in that passage, a principle I can support with other scriptures. And I apply that into my life. Good example passage. Noah says, does the Bible teach gen uh, geocentric model? Also, is once saved, always saved biblical? I don't know the answer to your second question. Noah, I'm asked that one a lot. I wish I had a good solid answer for you. Um, I, I do wish I had that. I don't know the answer. Um, does the Bible teach geocentric model? That I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think the Bible's intending to teach us the, the, the zoomed out cosmology of the solar system. I don't think generally that's what's going on. I think it's using phenomenological language um, or perspectival language. That, that means this is what it looks like. The Bible is describing how it looks. The sun is coming up and going down. It describes the circle of the earth. I think it's just talking about the horizon. I don't think it even intends to be giving you a description of um, what, what the world looks like from space. It's talking about how things look like from the human perspective on earth, uh, where we're at right now, where our feet are planted. And it's not even talking about the human perspective in China. It's talking about the human perspective of the author at the time in the Middle East somewhere, you know, that's, that's what it's talking about. So I don't think that gives us a geocentric model because I think we're reading those passages wrong. Uh, we do now, we do the same thing today. For instance, here's here, this might help if you're, if you're struggling with my explanation there. Um, I was up a little bit early this morning. I was up, you know, just after sunrise when the, the light is getting brighter and uh, everything's, everything's beautiful out and it's quiet and peaceful out. And I'm, I have a window out here. I'm looking at it. <laughs> it's quiet and peaceful out here in, uh, in uh, LA County, you know, and uh, at the moment. Um, now, do you think I just taught a geocentric model when I said that? You probably don't, right? You're not like, well, Mike obviously thinks that, you know, he said sunrise and he said brighter. So when he he thinks the earth is getting brighter and the light's not just moving to new places on the planet, he thinks that the sun is rising and the, and it's not that the earth is rotating as as the sun is is sort of, you know, our, our gravitational, you know, anchor. No, he doesn't think any of those things. Obviously, I'm not. I'm not even talking about uh, cosmology at all. I'm just talking about human experience. So when you read the text of scripture, this is what it's doing as well. It's just not that kind of work. Now there are times where there's like a passage in Job that says he hangs the earth upon nothing. That is a really interesting passage in Job. And if nothing else, I would be conservative with it. I don't want to overstate my case with it, but, but it sure is interesting. And it's hard. It's a little hard to, um, to figure out what on earth they meant other than what looks to be the way the earth really is hanging on nothing, so to speak. It's just suspended in space. That's pretty interesting. Um, anyhow, there are those. I think that's a pretty interesting passage. Wendy R says, Mike Winger. Oh, and it popped again. All right. I'm just going to go with the, question, the questions I can see. I'm sorry, Wendy. I'm so sorry to do that to you. It, the, the live chat popped down, and I don't know how far or where your comment was anymore. Um, Gary, Garrett Haynes says, um, would you say that God's wrath wasn't actually actively poured out directly from God on Jesus, but somewhat passively through the powers that be 
Is it God's wrath through letting man get his own way? I think, Garrett, that that might be an unfair distinction to think that if God's wrath is poured out through people, that it's therefore indirect. Um, I, I think that, that that's an unfair distinction. I think in scripture, God's wrath is poured out, to use that phrase, it is poured out through individuals coming against other individuals, an army coming against a nation. That could be his wrath poured out. It could be through famine. It could be through a disease that potentially, right? This is a possibility. It, it could be through all sorts of things. God's wrath is poured out in a variety of ways. So I wouldn't, I don't think it's fair to say, well, that's indirect. That's indirect. I do think though, that when we say God's wrath was poured out on Christ, we have to define God's wrath here carefully. And we shouldn't think God was angry at Jesus. I don't think that's the case. I don't think God was angry at Jesus. I don't think the father was angry at the son. The father was disapproving of the son. That's in fact, the opposite is true. What the son was doing was pleasing the father. It was pleasing him. It pleased the, it was a will of the Lord to crush him. It pleased him to do this according to Isaiah 53. So, so yeah, while I would affirm a wrath poured out on Christ, and I have talked about this in my, in my series on penal substitutionary atonement, I talk about it towards the end of the series. I go through, is this wrath? Is this wrath on Jesus? And I think the answer is yes. I think people just aren't uncomfortable with that answer. And I think part of it is because they associate wrath with petty irritation or, or God's displeasure on Christ. And that's different than the, the wrath being God's active judgment against sin. If we think of his wrath as active judgment against sin, when we say his wrath poured out, we mean he, just, he took action to punish sin. And he, his punishment of sin was on Christ. Okay, in that sense, yes. I, th- I, I think we should affirm it. Hope that helps. Let's see here. Uh, Josie J, what is systematic theology and what is the value in studying it? Systematic theology is a way of, of say, um, here's a crude example of it, is, is like, say you take a topic like prayer and you go through all the passages in scripture that relate to prayer and you sort of gather everything that they say about prayer and then you say, this is what we know about prayer from the Bible. You could do this with angels. You could do this with the, the, the deity of Christ. I go through all the deity of Jesus passages and then I kind of pull them all together and then I and then I tell you the summary of, of that. I think systematic theology is fantastic. I think it's great. I think the danger, potential danger in systematic theology is that we read texts out of context, right? Because I'm going, I'm looking for something on say the deity of Jesus or the doctrine of hell or something. I'm looking for something on that topic and that can cause me to sort of read, read it into places where it's not belonging. And the safety against this is to actually go and read the context of every single passage you're using. If I'm going to use this for hell, then I need to read the context to make sure that it's accurate. That's the safety that keeps us from doing it wrong, I think. All right, let's see. Uh, Josie said, thank you, this was bothering me. Good, I'm glad I'm glad that it helped. That was the question on First John and uh, taking people, or Second John, taking people into your home. Daniel James Hole says, can we see a live discussion between you and Dr. James White? Um, probably not because inevitably that would just be a debate. <laughs> it would not be a live. Like if you're thinking, but Mike, I just want James to talk to you because he can clarify things for you. Well, James has my cell number and I'm happy to talk to him. If he just, if he just wants to tell me where he thinks I'm wrong, I'm happy to sit and listen to him for an hour and a half. Just listen. I'm totally happy to do that. And to reconsider my views, I'm happy to do that. But a public discussion between the two of us is not about that. A public discussion between the two of us, let's all be honest now is about proving who's right and who's wrong. And that's a debate. And I don't, I just don't have interest. If I, like I said, I'm not super excited about debates. If I do them, they're few and far between. And I want to pray and be thoughtful about what I'm going to debate. In this case, I, uh, I don't probably want to debate on Calvinism. I just don't care enough about that topic to want to spend the 300 hours of prep it would take for me to be ready to debate James White, uh, who is an incredible skilled debater, which I am not. So, so yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I I would lose that debate even if I am right, (laughs) most likely, because he's just a really good debater. Uh, That's just, that's, that's how I see it. Um, All right, what do we get here? Krill says, uh, how would you answer someone who thinks the Bible is dumb because of the story of Jonah in the fish? Um, Krill, okay, first off, I would say that we should first ask the question of whether the Bible is inspired and miracles are possible. Okay, because if you believe that the Bible is inspired of God and that miracles are in fact possible, then any objections you have to Jonah and the big fish disappear. 
Uh, Second, I will say we don't know what the creature was that Jonah was in because the words that are used to describe it are too generic to mean. We have have fish, octopus, uh, whale, shark, dolphin. We have like different words for all these creatures. The word that they're using for whatever Jonah was in is a generic term that could refer to lots of different things. So we don't really know for sure what exactly that was. It does specifically say God prepared a great fish or whale or whatever it was sea monster of some kind. He prepared this thing for Jonah. That's what it says. God prepared it. He didn't just just say he sent one. He said he prepared one. That's a very interesting phrase. Seems to imply that this was not a normal creature, that something was weird about it. Now he could have done this through miraculous intervention. Boom. He could have done this through plot planning for a genetic mutation that would have caused an animal to have a weird deformed stomach that would allow uh, Jonah to survive. But we don't even know if Jonah survived. The text seems to imply that he might have actually died inside that thing and then cried out to God. His, 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 read, read the passage as Jonah tells his story in Jonah 2, I believe it is. It's, it's like, did he, did he die? I mean, and it seems like a picture of Jesus and his death and resurrection. It seems like that, that's what God's really doing with the story of Jonah and the whale. He's drawing a picture for the resurrection and death of Christ. Where, and Jesus taps into this when he says, no sign will be given this generation except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he speaks of his own death and resurrection as connected to Jonah. That's really interesting stuff. On the other hand, if you think miracles are impossible, then it doesn't matter what the Bible says, you think it's all dumb anyways, right? Because it's like, and God said, okay, you don't think that's going to happen because you don't believe in God or you don't believe that God speaks because that would be miraculous. That wouldn't be a natural event. Um, you, you don't believe any of those things. So you're picking on Jonah, but you really have a different issue against miracles and against God, that's what we should talk about. So if you accept miracles in God, Jonah's not a problem. If you reject miracles in God, everything's a problem. And we need to talk about that. Mammoth Revolution says, I have seeked God for for years. I have prayed and studied relentlessly. Why does revelation come so easily to some, but I feel lost and feel no connection to God? Um, Mammoth Revolution. I think that... You are. I'm going to venture a guess, and I could be wrong here, but I have to guess some things to be able to answer questions. I'm going to guess that what you mean by you don't feel a connection to God is that you're around people who are saying, God showed me this, God showed me that, God showed me this, and you're feeling like you're not receiving that. May I suggest that you might be measuring yourself against expectations that the Bible has not given you? I rarely, I do believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in the work of the Holy Spirit, right? But I very rarely have God show me things. Sometimes I'll come to think something and I don't know if that came from the Lord or not. And maybe if I went around telling everybody, God showed me this, I'm thinking this thing, I think it's true. I think it's exciting. I think it's wonderful. God showed me this. And then you hear me say that over and over again. And then you're thinking, well, God, I mean, I think of spiritual things, but when's the last time God showed me something? And this gives you anxiety. I think that you should just chill and don't worry about it. Um, yeah, when you read the text of scripture, God's showing you something. When you when you are aware uh, to do good and, and avoid evil, I think God's showing you something in a sense. It doesn't make you inspired and perfect, but there's a sense in which his spirit is working in your life. Be encouraged by that. But don't measure yourself against people who constantly say that they have revelation from God. I, I don't think that that is um, anything you should measure yourself against. That is one of the issues that was going on in the Corinthian church is that they were they were evaluating and using their gifts in ways that were uncharitable and and harmful even to some. Uh, Chris Mork says, what guidance would you give to a Christian with a loss of motivation? Praying less, reading the word less, caring less. My advice would be two things. Do it whether you care or not. That is a sacrificial act of love. Do it whether you care or not. Worship whether your heart is there or not. Not as a fake pretend issue but as an act of the will. Like in Psalms, we see this where he says, I will yet praise you. And those Psalms, sometimes he's going through all kinds of hardship and you could tell his heart is just in the bad place. And yet he says, but I'm going to praise God. Like I'm just going to praise God. This as an act of my will, I will, I will praise God. I think that those steps of prayer, reading the word, um, walk in that. And I think your heart will come alongside. But I, I think the second piece of advice, second piece of advice is going to be this. Are there things that are sucking the spiritual life out of you? 
and it could be just that you're all you're spending all your time binge watching, you know, unhealthy content or something like this. It could be that there's uh, ongoing sin issues. It could be that there's some other kind of issue. And I'm not trying to project something on you. Don't be paranoid. If there's issues, you, they're very obvious to you, right? You're not having to worry about everything. It should be very obvious. You, you already know, yeah, there's this and that. I probably should stop those things because those kinds of things can suck your joy away. It really can. And I guess I'll give one more piece of advice, which is find encouraging voices to listen to. People who, when you listen to them, you're not only intellectually fed truths about God, but you are spiritually encouraged by that person's voice in your life. Find some of those people, make them a regular part of your routine. That would also be my encouragement. Those online teachers who are just like, man, I just get, I just get stirred up in a good way when I listen to that person's ministry. I, I encourage that as well. AAI says, um, or AL, who knows? Because, you know, lower, lowercase i, uh, L's and uppercase I's, sometimes I can't tell. It says, sola fide or sola script, scripture. Um, wh- uh, also, who is your favorite prophet? I know it's a tough one for me, it's Elijah, but I love how adept Daniel was at problem solving and revealing others' deceit. Okay, sola fide, fide or sola scriptura would be the... The thing, uh, yes, both, both of those, but those solas are referring to different things, right? Sola, sola fide, uh, I'm saved by faith alone. I'm saved by faith alone. That, that's the idea. Faith alone by grace, by grace alone, apart from works. That's how my salvation works. And sola scriptura is not that the Bible's my only source for truth. It's that the, not at all. Uh, the Bible is the is the sole infallible authority in the church. It is the final arbiter of truth. There are other authorities. There are you know other church authorities um, and other authorities in the world and in life. There's other sources of truth, absolutely. But the Bible is that final arbiter of truth when it comes to Christian faith and practice. And it stands over popes and it stands over church leaders and it stands over even the apostles. Read Galatians chapter one. If uh, if if someone comes, even if it's me, even if it's one of us, even if it's an angel from heaven, don't believe him if they're bringing a different gospel than the one you already received. Well, where do we have the one we already received? We have it in the text of Scripture, and uh, so then therefore Scripture it has to be sola scriptura. Um, I'm like I'm all over that. However, it does not mean that we just rebel against authority. We don't care or respect for church authorities or listen to what they say. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, favorite prophet? I don't know. I, I'm tough with favorites. I, I have very few favorites of anything. Let me just say, um, if I had to pick one right now, I can't even do it. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's see here. Katie O'Brien says, thoughts on Hebrews 10.26 re- regarding possible losing salvation. Hebrews 10.26. This is a passage that comes up an awful lot. Um, and in the private messages, people send me through the website as well. And um, it says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, taken by itself, this passage would seem to mean that, oh, you know, if you go sin and it's on purpose, you you can't be saved. Like you lose your salvation. This would actually require sinless perfectionism if we take the passage that way. And this would cause a lot of anxiety in a lot of Christians as they read this. Now, someone could say, well, no, no, it's only if we go on sinning deliberately, like ongoing, constant behavioral sin deliberately, then we lose our salvation. But I don't, I don't know that this is actually about losing salvation at all in this particular passage. So um, let's read a little bit more of the context. First, it's talking about Jesus as our high priest. I'll just read the context to you since people were asking about this passage um, so much. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's a key, key passage, remember that. It's about there not remaining a sacrifice, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a, and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. 
How much worse punishment do you think will be tramp, uh, will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I think what, uh, what we're being told here is, let me see, how do I give you a quick summary of this? Um, in the, the law of Moses, there was a danger. If you reject the law of Moses, then you, uh, you, you're going to be, you could be, you could be killed, right? It's, it's, uh, there's a death penalty under the law of Moses. So you'd be killed with Jesus. It's, it's, it's amped up. You reject Jesus. It's eternal death. It's, it's an even bigger thing. The person who goes on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, I don't necessarily think that that person had to be saved. Pardon me. I've had hiccups today and I'm fighting them. Um, for if we go on sinning deliberately, I think that person is, is the person who is rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus, going back to the, um, the, the sacrifices under the law of Moses. They're going to those sacrifices. They're going back under the law of Moses. And ultimately, by doing that, they're sinning deliberately and rejecting the sacrifice of Christ. They're trampling underfoot what Jesus has done for them. That's my understanding of Hebrews 10, is that this applies to um, apostasy, not to, I have a sin issue in my life. Not that there aren't other passages that, that give you sin issues to deal with. You probably have to read a lot more of Hebrews to find it in context. Probably, uh, probably all of Hebrews 10 to give it more context. It's talking about how Jesus is the sacrifice. He's the final sacrifice. We don't need more sacrifices. The blood of bull and goats can't take away sins. And so the activity of continuing to do those things is actually an, a rebellion against God ultimately at that point. That'd be my understanding of that passage. Uh, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be shutting it down here, but I, I want to take uh, maybe one more question. Um, James Brown says, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit seen as a stumbling block for some. What does this mean? James, this is a good segue for y'all. Um, let me let me get it for you real quick, and I'll put it in the, li in, in the, in the live chat. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a passage that for a while I didn't really, I didn't really talk much about because I was concerned that um, that I might mis misrepresent it. I want to make sure I understood it correctly. So uh, eventually, I did a very extensive study on the topic, and I did a teaching on the topic, and I'm putting it in the live chat right now. So I'm going to end this video by suggesting that you go and watch that video. And I'm sorry for those of you who came for Peter Williams and just got uh, boring me. The uh, the plan is to reschedule that. Um, as soon as possible. And, I'll, and if you make sure to subscribe and click the bell icon, because my notifications are even last time I did a live stream, they didn't even all go out. Apparently there's just some kind of glitches going on with YouTube right now. The, um, yeah, if you want to know when that goes live, you're going to need to, to click the bell icon until then keep looking up, set your eyes upon Christ. Remember where our hope is and that, that the joy and the confidence and the trust, the peace and the rejoicing that you have in Christ, that you have because you're a Christian, is not phased in any way, shape, or form by even death, suffering, or coronavirus, or anxieties and fears about the future. This, sh this does not phase or touch our hope and our joy. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, God bless you.